Good afternoon, and thank you all for being here. I, I have the uh, the unenviable task of, of getting to introduce somebody who needs absolutely no introduction to anybody in this room, and that's Lily. Um, I thought about a number of things I wanted to say, and then I realized that none of them really needed to be said. I think everybody in this room is is well aware of, of the enormous contributions that Lily has made and continues to make to this campus, and, and uh, I'm looking forward to the address we're about to hear as much as you are. I guess the one thing that I would add uh, is that um, Lily has also been a terrific partner for me, something for which I'm eternally grateful. And I think the thing that I'm happiest about, frankly, is that she's going to continue to be a terrific partner for me and all of you uh, in the days ahead, even as she does reduce slightly her, her days of effort. So with that ado, I, I would like to bring to the stage the star of the show, Lily Marks. Thank you, Don, and welcome. I'm, I have to admit, I'm actually startled by how many are, of you are here, and now I'm wishing I would have actually had more time or made more time to prepare these remarks. But uh, uh, I do welcome all of you, and, and thank you uh, for joining us today. As we review some of the initiatives and the accomplishments of this past year and reflect on the challenges, priorities, and opportunities of the coming year, and it's really impossible in just a few short minutes to summarize and do justice to all the work and achievements of our schools and faculty. Over the years, I've learned that when you give a presentation like this, you're judged as much or more by the things you leave out than the things you put in. Because when you leave them out, people think, well, you didn't know about them, and you don't know what's going on, or you don't think what's going on is important. And that's absolutely not true. Again, time only allows a few brief snapshots of the year and our journey together, but it doesn't begin to capture all the important work that our faculty and our schools do each year. And really, it's in our schools where all the real work of this campus is done. And each dean addresses those accomplishments annually in their own state of the school or their own annual reports. But now that I've admitted that the real work is done in the schools, that begs the question of what does uh, campus leadership and administration actually do besides add overhead? And I'm sure all of you ask that question regularly. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, the fact is our work ranges from the mundane and impo but important issues of campus physical infrastructure, including traffic and parking, to mission critical operations such as the Office of Grants and Contracts and IT, to compliance risk management, and uh, 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 oversight and protecting the reputation and the stature of this institution. The work includes advocacy and philanthropy and ensuring that the schools and campuses as a public institution successfully deliver on our obligations to Colorado and to society. And most importantly, this work includes the strategic and, and visionary work that positions us for a successful future. It entails marshalling the resources and applying them to their highest and best use, supporting institutional priorities. It requires the ability to coalesce our diverse faculty and schools, as well as our institutional affiliates, who, as you know, we neither own nor control, such as our hospital partners, in a way that fosters collaboration and cooperation and allows us to leverage our individual strengths and resources towards common goals, challenges, and opportunities. And finally, it seeks to create the culture and the value system that we wish to define us. So what are examples of campus level leadership and management? And I'm gonna go back to some presentations of past years because much of our work today is rooted in that work. So three years ago in this address, I reported on the campus master planning effort and that was the first master planning um, initiative we uh, undertook since we actually moved to this campus. So the first one in probably 10 or 15 years. And that helped set the vision and the projections for the next decade, ensuring our campus is positioned to meet the challenges and opportunities ahead by making sure that we had the right infrastructure, programs, and resources. It was that work that really led to us becoming much more judicious about the campus use of dwindling space. And we are running out on space, uh, uh, out of space on this campus, which is extraordinary. It also helped us realize and recognize the need to, to move uh, 
light rail from its projected path, which was projected to come right through the middle of campus and to work to getting it moved north. And it also helped us initiate the planning uh, for the next educational and research buildings. So as I said, a lot of what we uh, talked about then and worked on then is really um, fueling the work we do today. At that time, we also discussed the importance of advocacy, philanthropy, and visibility, and the need for really opening up this campus and introducing this spectacular work to Colorado and the nation. As you'll recall, we began uh, to welcome national leaders, ranging from Rebecca Blank, who was the, then the um, U.S. Secretary of Commerce, to the FDA Commissioner, Margaret Hamburg, as well as a parade of local business, political, and philanthropic and community leaders, and introducing them to our faculty, to all of you, and the extraordinary work that you do. And it's fair to say that some of that exposure, I think, helped contribute to Denver being named as the site for the coveted expansion site for the U.S. Patent Office. Two years ago, I talked about the big things we're doing, our works in progress, and I provided an assessment of our then current reality and our strategic and operational opportunities and challenges. And I'll be updating with you today some of the progress on, on these issues. And then last year's address, as some of you may recall, we really talked about the new normal and how the external environment within which we are operating is so dramatically changing and how we must respond to these external ch um, changes and position ourselves to thrive. As all of you know, academic medical campuses across the country are struggling with how to sustain our academic and clinical programs at a time when all of our traditional revenue sources are challenged and the public and private sectors are narrowing their commitments to the very missions that define us. The external changes are creating an atmosphere that makes it very difficult for academic health campuses to thrive. This is the slide that was taken from last year's presentation, which addressed the new normal and, and how it's really redefining our missions. The changing environment really compels us to develop new skill sets and new mindsets in order to remain a successful campus of the future. Last year, I focused primarily on describing the challenges. But today, I'd like to provide some brief updates on the accomplishments that illustrate just how well we are responding to the new normal. While each of these is a work in progress, it's important to recognize how successful we've been, even during these difficult times. Increasing our clinical research and philanthropic resources when many academic medical centers are seeing a steady erosion. While I believe our most difficult challenges are ahead of us, there are many positive signs that we are beginning to adapt and effectively respond to the conditions of a new normal. So one of those major issues for us is developing a sustainable funding source, and all of you struggle with this, as do we, every single day. Uh, the good news is um, that in FY15, our current fiscal year, this is the first year in many that we've actually received an increase in state funding in general fund support to the campus, which is up 7% to $70 million. But here's the bad news, and that's when you place it in context, $70 million uh, when you consider that in 2003 we had $79 million. And if you actually increase that by a 2% inflation rate, Today, we're 43% behind where we were a decade ago in funding for this campus and the work that we do. And even while the state economy is improving, most projections for significant increases to higher education in Colorado after next year are really pretty negative. With respect to national funding, our primary funding source, as you know, is NIH. And that has been flat for more than a decade since the doubling stopped. And again, when you apply inflation, we have lost about 30% of the increase to NIH support since the doubling stopped just because of inflation. And many of you know very painfully that this has led to a kind of research Darwinism, with grant success rates dwindling to the seventh and eighth percentile in many of the institutes. And a real concern is that only a small percentage of, institu of institutions will remain standing as viable research enterprises. With greater than two-thirds of our grant funding coming from the distressed federal sector, the need to diversify our research program and portfolio and enhance our activities with industry and foundations and tech transfer really rose to center stage over this past year. 
Again, that's the bad news. But although our revenue challenges haven't changed since last year, it's really important to acknowledge, and it might surprise you to see some of the significant progress our faculty has made, even in these difficult times. This slide, or this graph, actually shows the key revenue drivers for the campus. And the green line represents state general fund, which I just talked about. But let's focus for a moment on the red line, which is uh, our research awards. At a time when many top academic medical centers have seen a significant decline in research awards and funding, in FY14, we actually experienced an 8.5% increase in research awards, which is remarkable. We increased 8.5% overall. Our federal awards increased almost 5% or $11 million in a year of sequestration and the federal government shut down and the phase out of the ERA grants. So that's quite a, an accomplishment. Our industry awards increased 17%, which increased the diversification that I spoke about. And over the last two years, we've received more than 65 grants that were greater than $1 million in grant budget awards to Anschutz faculty. And let me give you just a few examples of that. Uh, last year, our Colorado Clinical and Translational Science Institute, our CCTSI grant, was uh, received its five-year renewal totaling $48.4 million. Faculty like Catherine Casillas in pediatrics received a four-year, $11 million grant to expand, uh, to expand her child abuse prevention program. Dr. David Schwartz, chair of our Department of, of Medicine, received an NIH cadet award totaling $7.5 million with the goal of discovering new treatments for pulmonary fibrosis. Steve Abman in, in pediatrics received a four-year $7.1 million grant addressing the many unanswered questions of pediatric pulmonary vascular disease. And Jean Kuttner is co-PI with a colleague at Duke University, and together they have received $10 million in a five-year award from the National Institute for Nursing Research in the area of palliative care. This is a reflection of really extraordinary work in extraordinarily difficult times. Last year, again, in addition to the talk about needing to diversify our research portfolio beyond federal grants, we also talked about the need to accelerate the transfer of our research discoveries from the bench to the bedside to the marketplace. And 2014 was a banner year, as you can see from this slide. Um, in addition to 97 invention disclosures and 150 patent applications filed, we received 27 patent patents issued this past year, and, and 20 licenses, as well as 10 startup ca uh, uh, companies. So this is extraordinary in, in, in terms of a single year's progress, but we believe there's much more opportunity to be mined. So while the key drivers of success is the work of our faculty, it really is incumbent on the campus and the university administration to ensure that the research infrastructure is capable of, of supporting and enhancing our research efforts. And we haven't done as good a job of that as we should, and as you deserve. But to that end, um, there are three key changes that are worth uh, mentioning today that I think will make a huge improvement to our administrative infrastructure and support. Amy Gannon has been named the new director of the Grants, Office of Grants and Contracts. And for those of you who know her, you know that she's widely respected for her management skills and ability to build and re-engineer mission-critical systems for maximum, maximum operational performance. And I think many of us are confident that she's going to help Grants and Contracts expand its cri critical services to all of our faculty. Steve Van Nerden. Um, who we recruited or stole a couple of years ago from Mayo um, um, to head the, the Fitzsimmons Redevelopment Authority, has recently been appointed to a concurrent position as Director of Biotechnology Relationships for the Anschutz campus. And his focus will be to attract additional research funding to our campus through the creation of a research marketplace. And just recently, in the last few weeks, Kate Tallman has been uh, appointed as the head of the CU Systems Technology Transfer Office. And I know that she's already pursuing ways uh, in which the TTO office can serve our growing intellectual property needs um, that are emerging from the campus. So moving to healthcare, uh, as all of you know, the healthcare system and market is one of the most turbulent and challenging components of the US economy today. And 
a, one of the most troubling parts of our society today. Because clinical excellence, whoa, help? Anybody? The screen? I try, I'm trying. Oh. It takes about a half second. Okay. Um, so because clinical excellence and success is integral to our tripartite mission, and because clinical revenue is basically the budget glue, the critical resource that cross-subsidizes our academic missions, failure or deterioration of our clinical programs and our market position is simply not an option. In recent years, we've been positioning our clinical operations and our programs to successfully adapt to the new landscape in the healthcare market. And we've already reviewed the state and research revenue growth, but this, uh, this graph actually adds the blue line, which reflects our growth in clinical revenue. And as you can see, over the last decade, we have had continual growth for more than a decade, and it's been prodigious growth. Um, I should note that this, this line represents only the physician revenue, physician pro, pro fees and uh, dentistry revenue. It doesn't, and because those are rolled up into the university budget, it doesn't reflect hospital revenue, but our hospitals, both Children's Hospital and University of Colorado Hospital and Co University of Colorado Health System have experienced similar robust growth in both revenues and market share. Now when you look at this growth trajectory, it's hard to get concerned that clinical revenue is a problem. I mean, what's wrong with this graph? But it's important to emphasize how atypical this level of growth is for academic health centers and how tentative the future is for continued growth. The healthcare market is taking dramatic measures to reduce provider reimbursements and to marginalize high cost providers, AKA us. Um, and we're beginning to, to experience that um, in each contract renewal as we go forward. So what are we doing um, in the clinical arena? As you know, um, in the past couple of years, we formed the University of Colorado um, Health System, which is a key strategy aimed at strengthening our clinical enterprise in the face of these market dynamics. And major efforts have been expended over the past year to solidify the consolidation of this system. While there's been a strong market imperative uh, to create this expanded system, in truth, we're now dealing with um, the significant issues of diluted governance control, as well as the growing pains of a blended family in which we're the only academic uh, teaching hospital in a family of a number of clinical uh, community hospitals. So the, it was the right strategic move, I really believe that, uh, but we, I, now we're carefully establishing, or need to carefully establish, the role and the importance of a university hospital and an academic fac faculty and missions. And that's crucial leadership work in the next few years to ensure that they remain what is the defining characteristic of our healthcare system. Our hospitals and our physicians um, must also pay increasing attention to redefining the entire healthcare delivery system with a greater focus on quality, safety, outcomes, and value-based care, and building expertise in population health and evidence-based care. This could be at hours and hours of discussion all by itself. But after months of, of, of careful planning and deliberation, UPI is making governance changes to ensure that the School of Medicine's clinical practice is better equipped and positioned to make the high stakes complex decisions needed to address accelerating changes in our healthcare delivery system. We also must be creative and forward thinking as we train and design healthcare systems that leverage the interprofessional expertise that exists within our midst, including, uh, and including all of the health professionals, not just physicians, but advanced practice nurses, PAs, PTs, clinical pharmacists, specialists in oral health and in public health, and creating a system that is truly unique to meet the needs of our future. Last year, we also talked about the mounting pressures to increase class size and educational programs in the face of looming workforce shortages across all of the health professions. As the primary educator of Colorado's healthcare workforce, it is a major part of our mission, and we have lots 
of positive things to report as we seek to respond to these workforce training demands. Um, as you know, the School of Medicine um, has established and received accreditation approval for its Colorado Springs branch. And this year, in the entering class that, that started in August, they increased annual class size by 15%. And these additional students will receive their clinical training in years three and four based in Colorado Springs. Our College of Nursing and School of Public Health, um, starting with College of Nursing, um, They've been meeting to work increased demand as well, and this fall, with the CU Denver expanded South Denver campus, or South Denver facility, um, an opportunity that was created by the donation of the wildlife experience uh, facility to CU, um, the, the College of Nursing is going to be able to expand its highly competitive BS program in nursing by 30%. This facility will also provide expansion opportunities for our School of Public Health. Our School of Dental Medicine, as you know, expanded its building in 2012, and that added 64 new operatories, which has allowed them to increase enrollment by 54 percent, or 110 new students. Last year, our bioengineering program, which was uh, originally just a graduate program, expanded to include bio, uh, undergraduate bioengineering. And years three and four of that program will be taught on the Anschutz campus starting next fall. The program is going to reside in our new Bioscience II building, which is currently under construction. The high demand for this degree program is projected to grow to 300 total students within the next few years. The University of Colorado has launched a major initiative to invest in online educational programming. And this year, we have more than 3,300 nursing and public health students enrolled in online courses. And the campus will focus on targeted um, additional growth in programs where there is the greatest market demand. For example, our School of Pharmacy just launched the world's first accredited international trained PharmD program, and this fall enrolled its first students to this on online program. In the world of MOOCs, J.J. Cohn has taken his mini medical school course to the internet, launching this campus's first massive open online course in September. He took what has been a long popular uh, on-campus program and has made it available world worldwide. Today, thousands of people from all, over 100 company, countries are taking this course. Finally, one of our greatest challenges that we discussed last year is how we respond and adapt to the massive technological changes that are transforming research, education, and patient care. I already spoke about online education and MOOCs in the field of education. But perhaps one of the most exciting new areas of campus emphasis is how we transform our research and clinical programs in an era of big data. One of the accomplishments this year of which I am most proud and excited has been the ability to unite our institutional partners, Children's Hospital, University of Colorado Health System, UPI, along with the School of Medicine and other campus schools, to create and fund the development of a bioinformatics infrastructure called COMPASS and to build the Center of Personalized Medicine. This campus priority was launched in direct response to the consistent message from our faculty that bioinformatics and precision medicine capability will be the defining characteristic of successful research and clinical programs of the future. Biomedical informatics and the promise of personalized medicine is rooted in the ability to harness the billions of pieces of research and clinical data that have emerged and allows us to correlate and connect the dots between all of that data in ways that will lead to medical care that is more preventive, predictive, precise, and personalized than it has ever been before. Offer, offering customized treatments specifically targeted to a single individual, a single patient's profile and prognosis. This field is in its infancy, but the real players in academic medicine in the future will be those who master its science and clinical delivery. Over the past six to eight months, I've been working closely with the coalition of all of our campus clinical partners as well as donors and we have raised nearly $60 million to reach this goal. 
With the generous support of University of Colorado Health System, University Physicians, Children's Hospital, and the School of Medicine, we've, we've assembled $50 million. A trio of large donors have added an additional $10 million to launch and support this effort. And this slide reflects how some of these funds will be used. So we've talked a lot about our research, clinical, and teaching missions, but the fourth critical mission of our campus is community service. And while we've built an incredible facility here and programs um, on this campus over the past two to three years, I've come to believe that we've really failed in three critical domains. First, the Anschutz Medical Campus has become the epicenter for outstanding tertiary and quaternary healthcare services in our region. Yet, although we've become the leader in health care, we have not been a leader in, in improving the health status of Colorado citizens, helping to improve access to care and overcoming many of the social determinants of health. We should be a leader in this area, given our missions and expertise, and to date, we haven't been. To that end, um, we've been developing a program called Colorado ECHO, based on a similar program which we stole or borrowed um, from the University of New Mexico, which focuses on improving the capacity of our healthcare workforce statewide, using both technology and by leveraging the expertise of university faculty in association with many existing agencies and organizations. Tim Byers of the School of Public Health is leading this effort, and I see Tim here somewhere. Thank you, Tim, wherever you went. Um, uh, and he's working with faculty in all of our schools. And this is being funded by a planning grant by the Colorado Health Foundation, and we hope for, for a launch date early in 2015. Second, although we have become one of the leading economic engines for the state of Colorado, and you've, you've heard me talk about this many times, our campus generates $2.7 billion a year in direct annual expenditures, and we've created 19,000 jobs. But we have done very, very little to improve the economic, educational, or health status of our community neighbors. In some respects, this magnificent campus has been helicoptered in to what is one of the blighted, most blighted economic and educational and, uh, communities in our state. And our presence has done very little to address improving the plight of our local community neighbors. This year, we budgeted and launched the new Community Campus Partnership, which is a program being led by Robert McGranahan. And the goal of this program is to co coordinate our campus efforts with the multiple community organizations and NGOs in an effort to enhance our immediate Aurora community. And we're doing this via um, uh, educational pipeline, pro pipeline programs like our Aurora Lights program, increased campus job opportunities. Um, each of our hospitals and campus HR departments are trying to identify more opportunities to, to give jobs to people who live nearby. By improved com uh, community health care programs that are embedded in the community, including a health, an interdisciplinary clinic. And by building community, uh, and trying to pursue community wealth building opportunities. And then finally, um, now that we have this magnificent new campus, built out, we need to continue improving our campus life and building a more responsive and vibrant internal campus community with, uh, with its own traditions. Our annual block party is more than a fun afternoon. It's really an opportunity for many people to learn more about the vast array of programs and people and services that are, uh, uh, reside in and around our campus. Food Truck Wednesdays have been a great hit throughout the year and will continue. If you haven't noticed it, Look for the new signage around campus focused on encouraging walking and healthy lifestyles. And of greater significance, right now we're developing plans for improving our student health programs and particularly student mental health programs to better serve our student needs. Philanthropy. Um, if you look at our growth trends here, there's also much to celebrate. 20%, 28% increase since 2011. And in this last year alone, 19 gifts that totaled greater than a million dollars. Yet, when you look at this, the reality is that there is much work to be done. And this doesn't reflect what we believe is the true fundraising opportunities of a major academic health center such as ours. 
in an era of shrink shrinking revenues, almost every university is redoubling its, its development activities, and CU is not an exception here. Um, we have gone through a major restructuring of the CU Foundation within the last couple of years, as you know. And for this campus, uh, that means the hiring of Scott Arthur, who I believe is here, um, as our, uh, our Vice Chancellor for um, Advancement and Development, and uh, bringing a lot of the staff that used to be employed by the Foundation into the employ of the university, locating them in Building 500 and embedding many of them within your own schools and departments. We also have a, a, a new philosophy about fundraising. We've spent um, some time initiating important discussions with the University of Colorado Foundation on how we can work more collaboratively to enhance development opportunities. And finally, we can't talk about this campus without acknowledging the profound impact that the support of Phil Anschutz and the Anschutz Family Foundation has had on our success. Um, and I'd like to recognize and thank Ted Harms, who is the executive director of the foundation, um, who actually took the time to be here today, and I really appreciate that. And I hope you're learning about some of the good work we're doing with the foundation's support. Um, very quickly, facilities and campus infrastructure. Um, yes, cranes are still in the air. Um, the Bioscience 2 building, which is pictured here, is currently under construction and is about half, uh, halfway to completion. This is 112,000 square feet. Uh, Bioscience 2, which will combine research, business, and educational programs under one roof. Um, as I noted earlier, bioengineering is going to be located here when it's finished in August 2015, along with some faculty-run clinics. And the FRA is also leasing some substantial space in the building to house a growing number of bioscience uh, companies wishing to, to co-locate with the campus um, on the, on this, uh, in this building. Um, we are uh, working on developing a GMP, a good manufacturing practice facility. Um, which will be built within the FRA um, building on Montview, achieving a priority that, again, many of our faculty have said is a major infrastructure need um, and is essential an essential campus resource, enabling the safe development and manufacturing of cellular and gene products. Um, we're talking about an interdisciplinary building, um, the siting and scope yet to be finalized. Um, the VA, as you know, continues and continues and continues to be under construction, um, but we hope that sometime by the end of 2016 might be open for business. Um, we are talking for the first time with our campus partners, Children's Hospital, University Hospital, and UPI, about ways that we can work together more effectively in joint venturing some of our space needs. Um, we've talked about how we might creatively together meet the overlapping needs for faculty and administrative offices, and as well as maybe a joint data center, thus preserving capital and, and preserving our shrinking uh, land footprint. The Red Cross building, um, we've recently negotiated the necessary approvals to demolish the Red Cross building, which sits on Montview and is really unusable, unsafe, and uneconomic to restore. And in its place, we're going to be building an outdoor gazebo, which both retains the history of the facility, but gives this campus something it, it really needs, which is usable outdoor meeting and event space um, for the campus. And then finally, I mentioned our successful move of light rail to the north of campus. That's designated by the blue line that you see going north of the FRA land. Uh, but since that's been um, re repositioned, um, we're working with our hospital department de partners to develop timely and effective round trip shuttle service from the light rail to the campus so that people can effectively use this. So all in all, I hope that this leaves you with a flavor of the many initiatives that we've pursued and implemented um, or launched over the past year. While much of this is work that is invisible to the vast majority of our campus community, I hope that you will agree that it represents a significant amount of effort by administrative staff and leadership to enhance the campus environment and to facilitate and promote the work of our faculty. And I sincerely hope that you will join me in acknowledging the work of hundreds of campus staff who work tirelessly and with little thanks to provide campus security, facility maintenance, administrative support, and a wide range of other services that are invisible to most of us unless and until they don't work. 
I'd personally like to thank and to acknowledge Neil Krauss and Sherry Richards for their efforts and support. And we all uh, should join in singing the praises of Jeff Parker for all that he does every day. So next week um, marks 38 years since I started working on this campus. It's virtually my whole adult life. And I have really been blessed with many extraordinary opportunities to contribute to the transformational journey that our campus has traveled. I can honestly say that over nearly four decades, I have been inspired every single day by the work that goes on here and honored to be a part of it. In our transition from the old Ninth Avenue campus to the Anschutz Medical Campus, we have traveled a great distance and it's not just in miles. By any measure, um, as, the next, as, as the next few slides illustrate, in those years, we have built and moved to a campus rich with world-class facilities, and we have become a leading academic medical center recognized nationally for the quality, scope, and impact of our teaching, research, and clinical programs. By any measure, we are ranked in the top 20 to 25 programs in the country in each of our mission areas. But in truth, I don't believe we are in our future yet. We are on the threshold of that future. So what is my dream and vision for the Anschutz campus? Over the past 15 years, we have assembled all of the component parts, the facilities, the programs, the talent, to move us into the top tier 20 to 25 um, that we, uh, in which we now reside. But really, we're at an inflection point today. I believe that we are in a position where we can and should set the goal of moving from the top tier to the elite tier of academic medical centers. Our time is now. And this will require discipline, vision, and the relentless pursuit of excellence. That requires top talent and top leadership. Uh, this is one of the iconic symbols of academic medicine, the three-legged stool. And for many, many years in academic medicine, we considered triple threat faculty as the gold standard, the faculty that were experts in all three domains of research, teaching, and patient care. And the reality is that all of those now have become too complex and too competitive to make that a realistic go goal across the board. And so we don't necessarily expect that uh, um, as, as we once did. That said, what I believe is now necessary is triple threat leadership. We need campus leaders of divisions, departments, centers, schools, and the overall campus who understand the exquisite interrelationship of our three primary missions and how critical it is to make our decisions, establish our priorities, and allocate our resources in ways that enhance all three missions and to, that continue to weave this exquisite tapestry of academic medicine. This is really a watershed, watershed moment for the Anschutz Medical Campus. We have been blessed with strong and stable leadership for many, many years, and the stability, trust, relationships, and partnerships formed, and the tribal knowledge accumulated, which has really enabled great progress. All of us need to acknowledge the contributions of some very special people who have contributed enormous amounts, amounts to our journey and have left very big footprints on our campus and its direction. Dr. Richard Krugman, who has been Dean of the School of Medicine for 24 years, the longest serving Dean in the United States. He is the Dean of Deans, and it's impossible to summarize all of his contributions here. And those of you who come to the Bowtie Ball, I'm sure you'll hear many of them. Uh, but to all of us, to at least many of us, he has been a treasured colleague and a friend. And his greatest legacy, I believe, is building a culture of trust and collaboration that has enabled much of the growth we've talked about. Bruce Schroffel, whose unyielding belief that he would never have a top-tier university hospital without a top-tier school of medicine, led to a new era of hospital and physician collaboration and support that, had, that transformed our clinical programs. Chip Ridgway, an example of a true thought leader beloved and respected for his knowledge and wisdom and his quiet, humble guidance and support. 
They and so many others have been integral to where we stand today and have left, left us gifts beyond measure. But as I said, I don't think we are today at our final destination. It is the launching pad for what we should aspire to become. We are in the midst today of major leadership transitions that will hopefully continue this journey toward the top. As you know, we have recently recruited Liz Concordia as CEO of the University of Colorado Health System. She comes with a phenomenal record of leadership at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. We're also in the final stages, hopefully, of recruiting a new dean for the School of Medicine. And the final candidates have begun their campus visits, and thanks to David Goff for chairing that search committee. Um, we had the first uh, final candidate last week, and two more will hopefully visit us um, in the weeks ahead. John Harney has taken the reins of, as president of University of Colorado Hospital and is a wonderful leader and such a collaborative partner. And as all of you heard, have heard by now, the campus leadership is, cha is changing as well. As you know, on January 1st of 2015, I'm gonna move from my current dual role as Vice President for Health Affairs and Executive Vice Chancellor of the Anschutz Campus to a single role as VP for Health Affairs. Don Elliman is moving from his position as Chancellor of UCD and Anschutz to a more focused singular role as Chancellor of the Anschutz Medical Campus, leading both the oversight and the daily operations of the campus. And I've had the pleasure of working with and getting to know Don well over the past couple of years, and I know how deeply he cares about this campus and how committed he is to helping it succeed. <laughs> I've always appreciated the tremendous support that I've experienced here and have been so grateful over the years to those of you have, who have so patiently taught me about academic medicine, its complexities and its nuances, who've taught me about our missions and our campus and have allowed me to hold its beating heart in my hands. And I know that you will do the same for Don. Before I wrap up this presentation with some final thoughts about our collective future and the role of leadership, I do want to take a moment to comment a bit further on the change in campus leadership and my future role. First, I want to thank the many, many people who have taken the time to write or call or stop by um, in the past couple of weeks. Um, I, while I've been absolutely uplifted by your kind words, I do want to clarify three questions that were asked me most often. Um, given the timing and the nature of the announcement. Um, first, a number of you worried that this was precipitated because of a health issue, and I'm very happy to report it's not. Second, uh, many of you uh, were concerned and disturbed that these changes meant that I was somehow being displaced. And the reality is that last summer, I informed Bruce Benson of my intention and desire to redefine my role um, in this coming year and to start recapturing parts of my life that I have deferred for far too long. I was going to show you the pictures of my three grandsons, <laughs> all new within the last year. Um, I love what I do, but I'd like to do a little less of it. A mere 40 hours a week would actually feel like a vacation. And third, um, many of you have interpreted this as goodbye and that I was riding off into the sunset of retiring. I'm not sure I would ever be very successful at retirement. But beginning in January, I'm, I am cutting back in my role and my time. But it is my hope to stay actively engaged and actively relevant across a range of issues um, that I care most about and hope to add most value to. That it certainly includes an active role in the clinical enterprise and the boards of children's the University of Colorado Health System and the FRA. I'll also be active in onboarding the new leadership as well as providing support for those issues and initiatives where I hope I can bring to bear both experience and expertise. And I'll continue to represent the campus and academic medicine on a number of national boards, advisory panels, and organizations on which I serve. And Don and I have been working to define exactly what all of this um, looks like and how I can be helpful and effective. I'm not sure we've totally figured that out yet, but um, I do want to stay involved in the campus I love so much. As I said earlier, um, we have been blessed with great stability of leadership for a long time, but we can only grow stronger with new leaders and new perspectives, new visions and new strengths. It is a natural evolution of organizations. 
The greater reality, however, is that a campus as large, diverse, and dynamic as this needs many types of leaders, all contributing in unique and important ways to our progress. There are positional leaders, chancellors, deans, chairs, who have titles and vested authority and responsibility. But in truth, attaining success across our domain means that everyone can and must play a leadership role in some fashion, be it a research leader, a service leader, a leader in innovation. As we confront a future laden with change and challenge, I encourage each of you to consider how you can contribute to moving this incredible campus forward, whether it's at the head of the line or leading from the back row. We need wise and respected thought leaders, and any of you can become that. We don't need ringleaders. We all know the long inventory of problems. What we need is people across the campus who can lead the way in finding solutions and unique approaches to the problems. We need those who will emerge as our conscience leaders and the true north relative to the culture and values that we wish to establish. An environment that is moral, ethical, and civil, that values and respects all members of our diverse family, and leaders who will not tolerate behaviors in our midst that deviate from the standards and values that we embrace. In recent months, we've had a variety of university school and program climate surveys, and it's clear that there is still much work to be done to embrace, celebrate, and support our diverse community, be it racial, ethnic, or gender diversity, or the many other kinds of diversity. In this area, every one of us can and must be a leader in promoting and protecting our diversity, in rejecting behaviors that are abusive or disrespectful or harmful to any members of our campus community. How we treat people says more about us than it says about them. Finally, it's important to remember that whatever type of leader you are, the best leaders are servant leaders, tempered with humility and the recognition that our true success is defi defined by the ability to create, create organizations and programs that are strong enough that they can organically sustain their momentum and success. This truth is best illustrated by one of the best pieces of advice I ever got from a mentor. They handed me a glass of water one day and they said, Lily, stick your finger in the glass of water. And when you do that, I don't know if you can see it, but what happens with all of us is that our presence hopefully displaces the water and raises the level of the water. And we'd like to all think that that's the consequence of our being in the roles that we are in, that we raise the, the level of the water. But what they then said is, take your finger out of the glass. Where's the hole? Where's the hole? It's really easy to get intoxicated by your roles or your perceived importance. But our true success is not in the temporal roles or the titles we hold. Organizations move on with or without us. The only place that any of us, the only place that any of us really leaves a hole is in the hearts and minds of the people we love and the people that we have helped overcome their challenges or reach their goals. As the great Maya Angelou said, people will forget what you say, they'll forget what you do, but they'll never forget how you make them feel. So with that, let me wrap up with one final thought. Um, and sharing it is in part a tribute to my father who passed away last year at 98 and who lived a courageous and incredible life that inspired almost everyone who had the privilege to know him. But I share this primarily because of the powerful lesson of survival that it represents. Um, there's one particular piece of advice that he gave me that has actually propelled me through life. As some of you have heard me share in the past, um, my parents were both Holocaust survivors. My father was in Auschwitz and Dachau, and my mother in Bergen-Belsen. And when I was growing up, they rarely shared their experiences or talked about what happened to them. Um, they actually shielded my brother and I from that. But when I, when I grew older, I really became interested in not only learning about their story, but really understanding what were the characteristics of the people that survived. And obviously, a lot of that was luck and timing and circumstance, but were, were, but were there special characteristics of those few people that, that survived? Are there special characteristics that they shared? 
And what my father said to me is that, he said, Lily, one of the most important elements of survival is that you can't ever think of yourself as a victim, no matter what your circumstance. Because the minute you believe that somebody else completely controls your fate, it diminishes your response. And it reduces, then, your chances of survival. Throughout life, it's so easy and so common to look around you and think that many, if not most, people have a better life than you. Or somehow, they are living charmed and easier lives and spared many of the challenges that you personally are facing. But my, my, my father also said, Lily, to everyone that's blessed to live a long life, life will inevitably, inevitably present big and difficult challenges. It might be problems with your marriage, with your job, with your children, with your health. The challenges that befall you are not what defines you. What defines you is how you respond. So let me end um, with this magnificent quote by Viktor Frankl from his book, Man's Search for Meaning. And as you may know, uh, Viktor Frankl was a noted psychiatrist who was also a Holocaust survivor. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. We, and all of academic medicine today, are now in that space. We're being buffeted by the many, many challenges to the future of science, research, discovery, innovations, and the improvements in healthcare that are possible and within our reach. But just as individuals can take on a victim mentality in difficult times, whether they think of themselves as victims of the NIH budget, Obamacare, an unsupportive dean, a clueless chair, um, just as, as victims, just as individuals can think of themselves as victims, the reality is institutions can also take on a victim mentality, and I know many that are. These are clearly challenging times as the missions of academic medicine, about which we are all so passionate, are being threatened. Some schools, campuses, and health systems will succeed, while many others will falter. We are in that space that will determine our future, and we need to collectively choose our response. We can be the victims of change, or we can be the architects of change, and together achieve the hope and the vision of what we can become. So with that, um, my sincere and heartfelt thanks to all of you for what you do every single day to not only make your schools and our campus better, but to improve the lives of those in our community and who entrust us with their care. Your work undoubtedly changes the trajectory of our students and our patients' lives, and they and I am eternally grateful for all of that you do. Thank you. <laughs>